Welcome to the intersection of politics and everyday life. I'm Brian Lehrer. Today, a watershed moment for women in the workplace. The Trump Access Hollywood tape, the Harvey Weinstein revelations, and reports of outrages by the likes of Roger Ailes and Matt Lauer and so many others have torn a seam in our culture where truth-telling could pour out and no longer be ignored. So on this Valentine's Day, we'll talk about not sweethearts, but brave hearts confronting the abuse of power in the workplace. And there is much to confront. According to a recent Marist NPR PBS poll, more than a third of American women report they've been sexually harassed and abused at work. Nine of 10 Americans agree it's time for zero tolerance of such behavior. Today we'll examine how gender bias plays out in different kinds of workplaces and get practical advice on how both men and women can make things right. We have four guests via Skype from the University of California, Joan C. Williams, founding director of the Center for Work-Life Law at the Hastings College of the Law. She is author of What Works for Women at Work, a workbook. With us here in our studio, Susan Chira, senior correspondent and editor on gender issues for the New York Times. Michael Kimmel, professor of sociology at Stony Brook University, where he directs the Center for the Study of Men and Masculinities. And for a wider generational perspective, we've asked Michael's son, Zachary Kimmel, to join us as well. Zachary, a college student at Columbia University, wrote the youth-friendly version of the UN's Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Really, some say his Generation Z is becoming known for its cross-gender male-female friendships. How might that affect the workplace in years to come? Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for coming in. Nice um, so let me dive right to maybe the heart of the matter. Susan, does men's idea of masculinity need to change? I think so, because I think that in our culture, uh, all too often masculinity has been sort of mixed up with a kind of toxic brew of dominance, of uh, insensitivity, of uh, a sense of uh, control over women. And so I think what Me Too is showing is that you can't really address sexual harassment or conduct in the workplace without re-examining how men and women relate to each other in that workplace and how they see their roles in it. Mm -hmm. And Michael, your center is for the study of men and masculinities, Correct. plural. Right. There's more than one? That's right, of course, because, you know, just because we make gender visible doesn't mean we make race or class or age or sexuality or region or religion or anything else invisible. So we talk about different masculinities. Different men have different understandings of that, depending on all of those other uh, sort of uh, parts of our identity. At the same time, there are some places where we probably would agree, despite all of those differences. So for me, as a social scientist, what's interesting is, where are the points of contact, where are the points of agreement among those different groups, and where does race or class or sexuality bring us to different understandings of masculinity? And generationally, Absolutely. as his son? On, on that same point, I think that the plurality of masculinities is so um, crucial to understanding this, because I think um, for a lot of men looking at these revelations and, and grappling with this will say, well, like, I don't do that. None of the guys that I know do that. Um, and I think that that's a really important thing to wrestle with um, because I think for, for many men, I'll speak for me, um, you know, the sort of masculinity that I learned at home from my parents um, and their egalitarian relationship really came into conflict with the masculinity that I encountered when I left uh, my house, when I went to soccer practice and began to interact with guys my own age and, and heard you know, homophobic slurs for the first time, or if I was at school in the locker room, the masculinity that I encountered there um, was very disparate from the masculinity that I had encountered um, from my dad and, and, and from my, my parents at home. Um, and I think grappling with the, the really confusing messages that men receive um, can really give us a better sense of how to uh, move forward in addressing workplace harassment, sexual assault, and these sort of issues. Joan, with the very practical work that you do consulting workplaces and developing workshops and workbooks for people in workplaces, um, is this conversation so far more abstract than one you would have? Or do you talk to men about their concept of themselves as men, not just kind of set the rules for workplace behavior and respect? I think in many ways, this, this is a conflict among men, um, as both Michael and um, Son have pointed out. Because most men 
would not think of behaving the way Harvey Weinstein, for example, behaved. I mean, showing up, greeting a work colleague in your bathrobe with the bathrobe open, naked, is not something that um, most men would ever consider doing. Now, I think that what men need is some really simple guidelines as to what's expected, because although most you know, men don't know not to do that, um, by and large, I think a lot of them are worried. Like, how can, if I want to ask somebody at work out, how do I do it? Can I go out and have a few drinks with my work colleagues without getting in trouble? So I think it's really important to provide men with some really, really simple guidance on, for example, how to, how to ask somebody out. Yeah. Can I, I just want to say two things to underscore what Joan just said. It does seem to me one of the reasons that, one of the things that Zachary and I talk about is that there's a tremendous difference between his generation and my generation. It is certainly the case that, you know, that hold, you know holding court in your, in your hotel room <laughs> with your bathroom open, that's never been okay. But um, The Economist... I'm re- glad we can agree on something well, we did, but, but, but look, I grew up in an era where I expected my workplace to look very much like Don Draper's. And if you remember, Don Draper thought that the secretarial pool was, was basically a harem and one had access to those women was a perk. You know, I, and, and that, and he married one of them. Right, and that, uh, yes. for people who don't know, that's a reference to the TV show right. Mad Men. Right, right. So, so, so there's a mm-hmm. generational difference. You know, Zachary walks into the workplace and he thinks that this is not going to look anything like the set of Mad Men. So, so my, and, and there was a, there was a, a study that was done uh, that I read a couple of months ago that The Economist uh, published where they asked two age cohorts of men in the workplace, 18 to 30 and over 60. And they asked them not the ba- open bathroom question. They asked them the kind of the more microaggression question. Is it okay to call a woman sweetheart or honey? Is it okay to come up behind them and give them a neck massage? Is it okay to tell them they look beautiful? And the 18 to 30 year olds, they all said, no. And the guys over 60, well over half of them said that's perfectly acceptable. And so what we're doing is we're rewriting the rules as we speak in real time. The rules are being rewritten for this generation and not for this generation. Right. And Susan, you've written about the generational differences among women with respect to what they consider to be harassment or not even harassment, right? I think, I think there's a lot of, I mean, obviously it depends on the woman, but I, I think that what's really emerged in reaction to Me Too is that my cohort of women um, have, have sometimes um, looked at the attitudes of young women toward harassment and said, wow, um, you know, when we were growing up, we had this tension between really saying that sexuality was something we could own and, and that it was going to be messy to navigate. And also, when we went through the workplace, we were often first or almost first, and so there was a lot of stuff we had to put up with and learn how to push back against. Mm-hmm. And we want to make sure that, that women have those skills. Uh, at the same time, I think younger women have felt, I don't have to put up with any of it. And by the way, I agree they don't have to put up with any right. of it. You know, I'm not suggesting otherwise. But I think you've had generational differences in experiences and, and defining how much leeway we might give each other or define, I think, and so I think that the real challenge is for all generations, you know, it's what Michael and Zach and Joan were saying. I, I think people are confused about what's acceptable. Yeah but also because sexual harassment and assault is sort of a continuum sometimes of behavior, like Mm. bullying can often slide into situations of assault. So you have to, it's it's broader than you can't touch my arm. It's sort of, a lot of people who've researched this talk about civility and sort of rules of interaction that go Mm. beyond pure sex. So Joan, maybe you want to talk about the four categories that you have. Um, with respect to behavior in the workplace or, or enter this anywhere that you want from what people were saying? Well, one thing I wanted to say is that although I think that Michael and Zach are right that this is partly a generational issue, it's not only a generational issue. I think we shouldn't kid ourselves because out here, I'm in San Francisco and out here in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, there's still, and it's true in, I think, finance as well, there's still a lot of very old-fashioned bad behavior. There are still people being invited to strip clubs during lunch, and um, 
party corporate parties where they hire quote hot hostesses that who are that who are then hit upon um, as a matter of course. So I do think it's important and generational in that way, but there's also just a lot of egregious behavior that's going on in everything mm -hmm. from electronic gaming, gaming to venture capital to tech more generally. Sure. Um, but I think it's really important just uh, the, the four that uh, what we've been talking about sexual harassment is only one of really five basic patterns that women encounter and it's the combination of the five that makes it hard for them to progress. They also have to prove themselves over and over again, much mm -hmm. more so than men do. And a narrower range of behavior is often accepted from men, I'm sorry, from women, than from men, so that men, uh, women have to walk this tightrope between uh, lest they be seen as too masculine to be likable or too feminine to be competent. And after they have children, they kind of have to prove it again squared. It's called the maternal wall. Like now we know she's really committed to the job. And then the fourth pattern was what Susan was, was talking about and Michael too, because this happens between uh, among men and among women. Of men, there's lots of different ways to negotiate masculinity and femininity as Michael points out. And women end up pitted against each other. Um, this was the Catherine Deneuve situation, where Catherine Deneuve, um, a woman a little older than me, basically the only way to survive was to be part of the boys' club. And so now you have some women of that generation telling the younger women, you're just oversensitive. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important for Susan, for Susan and me and women our age to say, you know, your reality is very different. That's our success. Right. That's what we've accomplished. That's right. our gift to you, young ladies. Mm -hmm. Michael, do you think that there's just been a failure of men to change nearly as much as women over, let's say, the last 50 years of modern feminism? Women have incorporated more male ideas of professionalism sure. into their lives, um, more um, traditionally male ideas of leadership, that kind of thing, but men have not kept up in changing toward being interested in being homemakers as well as professionals, following their wives if they're the ones who have the better careers, to another city if that comes right. up, never mind doing half the housework and <laughs> being stay-at-home dads. I think there are still just seven stay-at-home dads in America. That's right. I mean, but, 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 but boy, but they the, get a lot of TV time. That's right. But <laughs> yeah. the, the pace of change between the two genders seems to me so remarkably right. different. So yeah, I, I think that that's that that's where that's where this conversation really begins. Um, you know, in in the early 1970s, the great social psychologist Daryl and Sandra Bem coded virtually every behavior, attitude, and trait you could find as masculine or feminine or neutral. And what they, they and it turned out that as as we've just heard from Joan about the question about competence and likability, Susan said this earlier. So for women, being competent and assertive and ambitious that that was coded as masculine. And being loving and kind and nurturing was coded as feminine. So women, for the past 30 years or half century, have been saying, that's insane. We can be both kind and generous and nurturing and competent and assertive and ambitious. We can, in fact, be whole human beings. Men have said we're down with the competent and ambitious part, but I don't know about the kind and generous part. That sounds a little gay. And that has been the way that we have policed other men from embracing m more of that ideology. Now, here's what's interesting. Here's the story we have been telling. There is a growing gap between what men are actually doing and what they think it means to be a yeah. man. What the ideology remains relatively the same in that sort of, you know, stoic and, you know, sort of hardcore professional winner, et cetera. But we're actually doing more housework, we're doing more childcare, we're sandwiched between taking our kid to soccer practice and taking our mom to the cardiologist. We are, we are, all, we are doing far more around the house than any generation of American men has ever done. So the behaviors are no longer in alignment with that traditional ideology. So Zachary, I don't know if, you'll, if, you can, if Columbia's the right place to see this, but <laughs> are men your age, um, and you're 19, right? So I guess I can start calling you a man. Um, the, the, you know, interested in traditionally female 
careers to any degree. As women more want to go into leadership positions, into tech, et cetera, where are the men who want to be elementary school teachers, mm -hmm. be social workers, mm -hmm. that kind of thing? It's, it's interesting. I'll say two things. One more localized to my community at Columbia. Um, I have to be honest, I haven't seen as much of the um, willingness among my male peers to venture into, into professions that are more sort of stereotypically associated with, um, with women. Um, almost every person you, you speak to at Columbia seems to be a financial econ major. That's kind of <laughs> how it works out, male and female too. Right, foot my wrist. Um, I, but I would, I would say that I think uh, I at least... Um, and, we all and heard that, Michael. <laughs> I'm somewhat optimistic. Um, there's a there's t a ton of work to be done. I think Me Too has um, has really brought to light that we are by no means uh, where we need to be as a as a, as a culture as a society. Um, but as you know, for me and my generation, Gen Z, um, we are a generation that is that has more gender cross gender friendships than any generation that has ever come before us, and we have a, more mothers who are in the workplace than any generation that has ever come before us. Um, I think the example that I was given at home from my parents, um, you know, where it was just as likely that my mom uh, would be, you know, driving me to hockey as it was that I know my dad would be at home doing laundry. Um, and seeing the egalitarian and egalitarian nature of their relationship um, was a huge uh, foundational element for me in understanding um, my future relationships with women, both platonic and potentially romantic. Um, and I think that so many more men of my generation um, are getting that foundation at home. And we're talking yeah. about a lot of men in offices and women in offices. Susan, you wrote about blue collar men recently mm. in mm. construction work, assembly line work, things like that. Can you talk about that? Yes, I, I mean, I think that the point that Zach made that um, it's rare to see men going toward traditionally feminine jobs. And what I found in, in doing some research on sexual harassment, we looked at it in two Ford factories in Chicago, but in, when I talked to a number of people more broadly, is that there, you know, jobs kind of get typed, like manly jobs and womanly jobs. And a lot of the jobs, like construction and shipbuilding and mining, got seen and typed to be jobs that were about being masculine. You earned a good living and you used physical strength. And when women broke into those jobs, it was, it, it was a kind of assault on, on their masculinity. It was like, so the women who went to those jobs often endured the most severe harassment. It's an invasion. It yeah. really was an assault. And it's a problem. It's a continuing problem. Joan? It was, it was assault on the masculinity of the men, the right, perceived right. masculinity of the men. Um, and there, there are still a lot of jobs, and blue collar jobs are a great example. I mean, there are over 90% white men, most right. of those jobs still. Um, but there are, be, uh, being a venture capitalist, there are a lot of jobs where work is basically a masculinity. Um, exactly. And Joan. it's sure. uh, the idea that um, we're supposed to be here to be adding value is very much confused with the idea that like my button is bigger than your button. Right. Um, quote the our honored president. Right. Um, you know those are those are those have no relationship at all. And right. if you're focused on buttons, you're not focused on profits in a very effective way. But if work is a masculinity contest, then harassing women just becomes one way of keeping. Or, sure. or, as Susan points out, one way of keeping women out. Because if women are in, then I guess you're not proving your masculinity very effectively because it's not only a job a man can do. So it becomes a matter of identity threat Joanna, to have Michael, women. Michael, I think you both do trainings yeah. in the workplace in different kinds of ways. Right. Uh, do you want to pick up on what she was yeah, saying and I go do, there? I do. I want to say just one quick response to what Joan and Susan were saying. Um, the fact that Zachary doesn't see this movement, um, I, I'm a social scientist. I have a hypothesis. If we tripled the pay of social workers and nurses, we would find more men going into those fields. I don't think it's simple, simply gender. It's also mm -hmm. about a a income. Um, so I, I think we put our resources in different places. So we pay sanitation workers more than we pay elementary school teachers. Um, so, but you're suggesting that men are less, uh, that you're suggesting that women, women are more 
willing to go where there isn't as much. Well, I, what I'm saying is two things. I'm saying, A, that both, but what Susan and Joan were saying is completely right, that it becomes a masculinity contest, that women's entry is seen as an invasion into a male turf. I, I definitely get that. But I'm saying if we want to change that as a policy issue, right. one way to do that is not simply by working on people's gender identity, but change the, the finances. Yes. Mm -hmm. The, the yes. poll functions. But, Joan, oh, okay, uh, you so, so you would ask me about, about workshops. I do a lot of work in corporations. I've certainly seen what Joan, what Joan sees in, in Silicon Valley, the bro, the bro culture and bro grammars. Um, and there's tons of women coming into those, those jobs and they're not staying because the corporate, co they have the great policies, they have all the, the, the parental leave, they have vegan food, they have massages. But the, cu the culture is mm -hmm. like walking into a frat house where guys haven't changed their t-shirt in five days. Mm. So the, the w women say, I'm not staying here, and they leave, so they can't retain the best talent. Um, I, th I find that a lot of the men, and you probably have heard this too, most of the men that I talk with now in companies are saying things like, I don't know what to say. I don't know, tell me what to say. Tell me, I don't want to say anything wrong. I'm, what, I feel like I'm walking on eggshells. And I think, that I think I take this as a very positive sign. I think men should be sitting for a moment with this discomfort. You know, let it settle for a bit, think about it. But I think what it's basically saying is most men don't want to be jerks. Most men don't want to say the wrong thing. Most men don't want to offend the women that they work with. And we don't know how to do that, but we so, don't want to. So, so Joan, how, how, what do you say to men who say, I don't know how to behave, I'm confused, I know there's yeah. a zero tolerance era now, but I don't know what that means. Well, for example, if you want to ask somebody out at work, now a few places have no dating policies, but not many. So you can ask somebody out uh, at work, but here's how to do it is what I say. Imagine that you and she are friends and you've had that relationship for a long time and you want to keep that friendship but you'd also like to take it in a different direction. So you say, you know, I really value your friendship and if you want to leave it there, no harm, no foul. I'd love to take it in a different direction. Are you interested? It's very simple, but I mean, that actually meets the legal test yeah. for not being sexual harassed, not yeah. being sexual harassed. Mm. And then if she says no, no harm, no foul, you have to treat her exactly the same way as you did before. That, well, that, well, although um, even with that, you can't unask her out. She will always well, know that you're interested in that way. Asking somebody out once respectfully will typically be very far from the legal definition of sexual harassment. Yeah, sure. um, or, for example, people say, well, can't I just go out and have drinks and joke with my friends? Or can't we love, you know, everybody in my department, we, we do sexualized joking, but everybody loves it. And the legal test is... It's, not, it's sexual harassment if what you're doing is unwelcome. So are you enough of a mind reader so that you know that everybody in your department it's welcome to? Yeah. If you are not that good a mind reader, then you either have to not do it or you have to ask them in a context where it's very clear that they can 100% say no without any consequences. That's kind of hard, which is why highly sexualized joking in the workplace is kind of a risky business. You have to get start out from the legal test, and I think give people really, really unfreighted, concrete rules. Because I couldn't agree more with with Michael. Most most guys, about fifty percent of guys now, were worried. Oh my golly, what yeah. am I supposed to do? So we just need to give them some real simple yeah. guidance. Susan, do you think this is a moment of real fundamental change, or is this a media bubble around this for these few months, and things are basically going to go back to where? There they are, and you know, there's yeah. the, the backlash is going to devour it. Well, let's just say I think journalists have a crappy track record of prediction. <laughs> uh, that's not what we do well. I, I, at first, I was skeptical. I've become more optimistic that we're at a fundamental moment because I think we've seen such accountability. That is, men losing their jobs, which in a, in a regular way, which has not happened before. I don't know where it's going. I'm fascinated to see, but I do sense. A, a, a real tectonic shift. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how thorough it will be, I don't know how complete, but something has changed. This behavior is not gonna go back to being acceptable, right. I think. I, I think the major th thing that's changed is that women are being believed. When women come forward and speak, they are being believed. And this is, did that happen yeah. overnight? 
This happened because 25 years ago, Anita Hill spoke, and she was so vilified that women went underground and they started talking to each other, but they didn't go public. And that, for 25 years, women have been telling each other these stories. So when they saw it on that Access Hollywood tape, they said, oh, I recognize that, I know that. Surely that'll disqualify him. And that, I think, sparked a kind of outrage that then led to where we are now. Especially so is, when it didn't disqualify him. It didn't, him. that's right. So my yeah. feeling right now is that what we're looking at is a, is a moment when even Mitch McConnell said he believed yes. the women yes. who accused Roy Moore. You know, and I mean, everyone knows that these women are telling the truth. So I think that is the moment, the reckoning now is that for the first time women are being believed. And Zach, when this you said before call. that people in your generation are having more cross-gender friendships, and I think there's some polling to back this up. Absolutely. What does that mean? Non-sexual male-female friendships, and what would that change? So I think a, a fundamental uh, shift that has to happen for more men uh, to be brought on board um, in support of gender equality, feminism, um, and be more um, outspoken against sort of sexual assault and um, sexual harassment um, is first and foremost to recognize it as inherently wrong, but also um, to look at the, the women in their lives um, as sort of as relationships they already have. So they, because we are the generation with the most cross-gender friendships of any generation before us, uh, we know that those things are wrong because we would never want them to happen to our, our female friends, our girlfriends. We would never want that to happen to our mothers, our sisters. Uh, he, Dad always likes to say, or Michael, sorry, uh, always likes yeah. to say um, <laughs> that if you want to... Professor Kimmel. Professor Kimmel, sorry. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you want to meet an instant feminist, uh, go ask a guy whose daughter just hit puberty. And he will say, oh my gosh, there are boys out there who are looking and talking about my daughter the way I was taught to talk and look at women. Um, and I think that recognizing both that sexual assault is inherently wrong and, and unjust and a crime, but also that it affects real women in our lives, real women that we know and that we actually have uh, substantive relationships with. Michael, does this guy know what he's talking about? You know, <laughs> look, I, I, I mean, once and we have 20 seconds left. Once upon, a once upon a time, The Onion, real fake news, had a, a headline that said, Eminem furious that his daughter's dating someone raised on Eminem's music. That's what he's talking about, that we are, you know, when we personalize it, we shouldn't have to. It's moral, it's right, it's fair, Absolutely. it's just. And, um, but it's also personal. And on that enigma wrapped in a conundrum, I wish you all a happy Valentine's Day. Thank and you thank too. you all and for to joining you. us. Thank, thank you, too. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. And that's our program for today. We're here each week, midweek, at this hour, at the intersection of city politics and everyday life. Next time, congestion pricing. Can it really dissolve gridlock and fund the subways? And why are taxi drivers so up in arms? Till next time, do tune in to my radio show, The Brian Lehrer Show, on WNYC 93.9 FM and AMA 20 at 10 a.m. Monday through Friday. Tomorrow morning are Trump and Bannon, patriarchy's last gasp. Thanks for watching.